Welcome back to the Canadian Rock. This is Jamie Gray coming to you. This pod, you're going to want to stick around. We have Katie Sadlier. Katie is a general manager of Women's World Rugby. She's got an interesting bio for sure. She was at the 84 Summer Olympic Games and 86 Commonwealth Games as a synchro swimmer for New Zealand, even though she's Canadian, but she's uh, living in Ireland right now, kind of commuting back and forth to New Zealand. She also spent 25 years in high-performance sport management for New Zealand. As I said, currently the World Rugby GM of Women's Rugby. She's been there since 2017. And she's been a leader in the Try and Stop Us Women's Rugby campaign. You're going to want to hear from her. Katie has got a lot, brings a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of great ideas to the game. And it's, uh, it was a great conversation. Before I get to Katie, though, contact information, plug in for us here. You know, if you want to contact us, we're, as you know, as you should know, if you're, if you're a loyal listener or if you're new, we're on the Twitter at Canadian Ruck. We're on the Instagram at the underscore Canadian underscore Ruck. We're on Facebook. We have a group there at the Canadian Ruck. And our email is a Gmail. It's CanadianRuck at gmail.com. Never hesitate to reach out if you have questions you want guests on, you want me to ask questions to guests. I'll do whatever I can to make sure that that happens. Just as importantly, though, if you want to watch, we're on YouTube. If you want to listen, we're on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, CastBox. So make sure you're watching, make sure you're listening, make sure you're following, make sure you're subscribing. And most importantly, make sure you're sharing this out. I put up my Christmas lights the other day because it was beautiful out. Uh, they're not on yet, but I, I'm starting to put them up because it's been unseasonably warm here in New Brunswick, Canada. Um, but I was listening to podcasts. So do the same thing. You put up your Christmas lights, listen to podcasts. You're going for a drive, listen to a podcast. You're, you're getting together with your, with your friends for a couple of pints, put on a podcast. Make sure that these great stories of our Canadian athletes are getting pushed out. It's nice when our rugby players can be recognized for the hard work they do. So the more people you tell, the more people know. If you don't know where to send them when you do, send them to our website, thecanadianruck.weebly.com. That's where everything is kind of launched from. You can have, there's active links there to send you to Spotify, to send you to YouTube. It's all great. From there, a little bit of rugby news. International news on the women's front. Um, this is kind of, kind of pretty cool. Uh, actually, it's not cool. It's the complete opposite of that. Sorry, I was reading the wrong notes. Um, but on the women's side, World Rugby and Rugby Europe decide to postpone the Rugby World Cup 2021 European Qualification Tournament. Makes sense. It was supposed to happen December 5, 12, and 19. Uh, there's this little thing going around the world right now called COVID. Uh, and apparently it's put a damper on this tournament. So they're looking at uh, rescheduling in early 2021. Uh, is they need that to happen because they need uh, for the Olymp sorry for the World Cup they need to make sure all those extra spots are filled. This uh, this one was supposed to feature Ireland, Italy, and Scotland, plus the winner from the postponed Rugby Europe Women's Championship. So there's a there's a lot in the mix there that has to get straightened out. This is what I was going to say was cool, so uh, I apologize. Super Rugby for 2021, it's looking right now that there's going to be a new Trans-Tasman format founded uh, to start. So as of now, it will be a six-week competition. Five clubs from New Zealand, five clubs from Australia. And the competition would start sometime in May after Super Rugby Eritrea. I know I said that name wrong, so I apologize to any Kiwi fans, uh, but I tried. So what will happen is New Zealand will have their own Super Rugby like they did last year. Australia will as well. When that's done, then they'll do a combined one. So in all, if you make it to the finals of both, both play, you could play upwards of 14 matches. But this is all under the impression that COVID restrictions lessen or remain the same between those two countries. And this one's kind of neat. And this, uh, this one's going to roll into our gray area. So pay, pay attention here. The blood is slow carding. All right, last match last weekend between uh, Australia and New Zealand saw a couple reds, both of them very similar plays, shoulders to the heads. Probably not intentional, but reckless nonetheless. Um, Sir John Kerwin, who played uh, famously for the All Blacks in the first World Cup win in 87, he stirred up a lot of criticism when he said after the match, this is what he said, our game does not need red cards. People have paid good money to watch a game of rugby with 15 aside. So from, from that, he suggested players should be replaced instead or put on report. So if you get a red card, you go off, but somebody can come on so that you keep your 15 aside. I'm a little torn. It's kind of neat. Many feel, though, that his thoughts are very old school in thinking. But when you look at most sports, if you look at 
hockey, ice hockey, if, if somebody gets thrown out of the game, you know, you might be shorthanded for five minutes, but you still can play five on five after that. You can't bring another player onto the bench, but you still have players available in the mix. I don't know. Former Canadian international Cameron Pierce, and this Cameron re- was forced to retire in 2016 from severe post-concussion, said to, to, to Kerwin, he basically he tweeted him out and said, get with the times, Kerwin. And also, meanwhile, ex-England international Hugo Manier labeled the comments as unhelpful and irresponsible. So some people, some players that are from more current times are really last, blasting out on him. As you were probably well aware, laws targeting the heads, they've been tweaked over the last few years, especially during COVID. They've tried to make a better attempt at that. Main focus, player welfare. And I don't think anybody could argue that player welfare is not an important part of the game. It's it's at the utmost uh, of importance right now. Watching that game and watching those highlights and watching the slow the slow mo plays of those, neither neither play looked malicious. But when it comes to being carded, is there a difference between intent to injure and a reckless play? It might be a difference in suspension time. I believe uh, the Kiwi got three and the Aussie got four matches. But at the end of the day, a headshot is a headshot, right? Regardless of intent or maliciousness, I'm not sure. So that would pre- that would take us into our gray era. Is John Kerwin is John Kerwin right? Should red cards be taken out of the game, or should red cards remain intact at the referee's discretion based upon the laws? Right, red cards out of the game, or placed at the referee's discretion and remain in there based upon the laws. I'll tweet that out midweek and see if we can get some uh, see if we can get some feedback on that one. What your thoughts are? Break par golf. Talked about this last week. Great spot. Here to help you break par, not your wallet. Let break par regrip your clubs this golfing off season. Take, drop them off. Chris will t- do them up for you. Get them all primed and ready for you for next year. He's serving the Rossé, Southern New Brunswick areas. Find them on Facebook at Break Par Golf Sales or hit them up on their website, breakpargolfsales.weebly.com for your chance to chat with Chris and figure out what needs to be done with your clubs to help you with your game. And now, Katie Sadlier. All right, so welcome back to the Canadian Rec. This is Jamie, and we were fortunate to have Katie here with us. Katie, it's a welcome and a thank you for joining us at the Canadian Rec. Oh, it's great to be here. So Katie's uh, in New Zealand right now, and uh, she lived there a little bit in her high school years, and, and she spent a lot of time there, but she's got a lot of Canadian roots as well. So let's hear your story. Let, you know, born in, born in uh, overseas and moved to Canada and kind of all over the place. You've got a little bit of global citizenship going on. Yep. Olympic okay. athletes, like talk to us a little bit about your story, how you got to where you are now at women's, uh, women's right. world rugby. Right. Okay. Well, I do, I call myself, um, well, I was actually the assistant chef to mission, uh, for the New Zealand Commonwealth Games team that competed in Victoria, Canada. And at the time when I applied for that, that role, I kind of positioned myself as, as the Commonwealth kid. I was born in Scotland in Aberdeen, um, to a Scottish mother and a Perth, Western Australian father. Um, who had met in Canada, but we're, we're in, in Scotland at the time. When I was two, I moved back to Canada and I lived in Canada, um, grew up in Vancouver, um, Coquitlam. Uh, and I was there until I, was 15, until I was 16. And then I moved to New Zealand and stayed in New Zealand all the way through did my, um, most of my university, although I did pop back up to UBC for a, a year in, in played water polo for a UBC. Um, but I stayed in New Zealand in terms of my most of my professional perspective all the way through till I took this role as the general manager of women's rugby in Ireland and I moved to Dublin in January 2017 um, and I, I'm temporarily in New Zealand right now because of course New Zealand's hosting the rugby world cup in 2021 and we have, um, we've just passed the one year to go and we've got pool draws and all sorts of getting the hype and getting people excited about rugby. Um, but my, my sporting career was kind of mixed as well in that um, I was very much an aquatic. I didn't play rugby, although I, um, I did get married to a New Zealand rugby um, halfback who was playing within Wellington, who I'm not married to at the moment. But uh, I, um, I grew up in the water, really, was a swimmer for most of my life. Um, 
the majority of that being a synchronized swimmer in, in starting off in, in Vancouver, you know, at a time when Canada was really leading the way in terms of, you know, Canada, USA, and Japan being the top three countries when I was growing up. So I did synchronized swimming and it took a reasonably high level. I, I competed at the Olympics in 1984 and I got a Commonwealth Games bronze medal in 1986. Um, but I also played water polo, uh, as I said before, for my province in, in New Zealand and also for my university, which was UBC Cross Canada stuff, like Canadian Winter Games and Canadian Summer Games and all that kind of sort of, that sort of stuff. Um, shall I go on, Jamie? Keep going on no, about my career? Yeah, that's, that's, that's really on. cool. That, okay. Yeah, so just walk us, you spent- How did 20, I get this job? You yeah. spent 25 years with high performance, I think, in New Zealand, high performance yes. sport. Yeah. So, so basically my back, so, so when I competed at the, eight, the 84 Olympics, I think that's when I decided um, career wise that this would be a pretty cool um, career to make for myself as opposed to just my, my sporting career. And I did want, I did have a vision of um, doing quite a lot of team management and I got involved in, in quite a lot of um, like world championship games, teams management and pan packs and, and stuff like that. And that, that was really quite exciting. And then at a, at a really young age, um, well, when I kind of retired from swimming, uh, I was on the board of New Zealand Swimming as a director, um, I think at the age of about 24. And I was also, I had decided that this is what I wanted to do for a career. So I did a, an undergrad in sports management and a master's in sports management. And then just started working in the New Zealand sporting um, infrastructure for a long period of time. And, um, you know, so most of my career was in sport. I had a, a little bit of a jump outside to do some really interesting things in the arts world. But while I did that, the Minister of Sport put me back onto the board of, I guess the equivalent of, um, well, no, not in Canada, because you don't have a, it's not a crown entity, but in New Zealand, we have a, an organization called Sport New Zealand and High Performance Sport New Zealand. And so that that is kind of looking after um, from grassroots through to, um, the domestic side is Sport New Zealand, and then the elite side is High Performance Sport New Zealand. And, and one of my legacies um, in terms of when I left the sector was I was responsible for establishing New Zealand's elite sports system um, back at the time when uh, New Zealand, um, Sydney got the Olympics in 2000, but when it was awarded the Olympics, we realized we didn't have a structure inside New Zealand sport to really drive performance on an international stage. And, and I was given this amazing job of having a look around the world of, of where was good practice in elite sport performance. I had a three month tour, best, best practice study tour, having a look around everything in, in North America and Europe um, and Scandinavia and, and in Oceania, just basically looking at who was doing great things. And so I led the development of, of what we have in, in New Zealand, an elite sports system. And then um, I kind of stepped out, was a director and I won, um, I guess two years ago, I won a, well, sorry, not two years ago, I've been in the job for four years, but um, two years before I started in this role, I won a Lifetime Achievement Award for my contribution to sport in cool. the country. And at that stage, I was sort of at this big event, it was a surprise, and I had this amazing mentor reading my, almost like my eulogy, I thought, oh my God, I'm 50, <laughs> who, who wins this when you're 50? And I just kind of decided, I, you know, I was wor not working in the sector, and I thought, you know what, it's time to jump back in. I was doing governance stuff and this job came up, general manager of women's rugby at World Rugby. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. You know, just looking at the potential for what is, I think, you know, one of the most amazing women's sports, well, sports full stop around the world to um, have a blank sheet to really grow and capitalize on the game. So I threw my name in the hat. It was kind of a reasonably long um, interview process. Uh, but it really got me fired about what the potential was for women's rugby globally. And, and, um, and I was fortunate to be given the job. And, you know, when people ask me what I do, you know, there's not many jobs like this. I mean, I, I do have some close, a close girlfriend in, in football and soccer who I spend quite a bit of time who have similar roles as me. But, you know, my role is to accelerate the global development of women in rugby around the world. And I visit all sorts of countries and speak to all sorts of inspirational women, men and, and girls, just creating opportunities for people to play and develop a love of the game. That's like, wow. I know. Listening, wow. Listening. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's uh, like you bring a lot of energy. So I, I imagine that helps, but it's, um, I, I don't know, ironic's probably not the right word, right word, but you never played rugby. You grew up in BC where, you know, it's in Canada, rugby hotbed. You spent a lot of time in New Zealand, which is definitely a rugby hotbed. 
but you're like you, you've you've you're a self-proclaimed water water expert, right? How does that mindset? You're obviously a a gifted athlete because you you represented at the Olympics and Commonwealth Games. How does that mindset help you in your role on the world stage with women's rugby? Yeah, I think that I think that one of the things that most elite athletes develop at a really early age is an understanding of how to to be the best you can be. So you have that kind of mental philosophy of understanding where you're at, where do you want to go, where you want to, you know, what your goals are. I mean, I've always been someone who set um, specific goals for my life in terms of career. Um, and I believe your career is not just about your, your working environment, it's about your life. So whether it's your fitness or your family, your friends or, your, your, or, or what you do in paid or unemployed paid employment. So I've always been very, very focused on planning, goal setting, um, incredibly good time management, understanding how, how you get people to work along um, with you to make the most of what it is you're trying to achieve. And so from that perspective, you know, you, you learn those skills at a really young age. Um, you know, when you were, when, when I was a, um, a synchronized swimmer, an elite synchronized swimmer, we were training like 35 hours a week. Um, it kind of so was, it, it definitely, to do anything else in your life outside of that, uh, and we weren't, we weren't professionals at that stage. Um, you had to be very, very organized, but you had to actually know how to get, how to get to where you wanted to go to. So from that perspective, you know, understanding the basis of, um, of, uh, really knowing how you actually pull together with you to develop something um, that is going to create something that's quite spectacular. And I, I kind of, you know, and, and I, I love working with people who, who also, you know, helping people create um, their dreams and their futures about what it is that they want to achieve. So, so in this current role, you know, I, I'm really fortunate. I work with women all around the world, women and men around the world, um, but a big chunk of women who just are, are absolutely focused about um, transformational change and leadership and uh, using um, the game and the values of, of rugby to create opportunities for others, um, not just themselves, um, in a way where it's a sport that's just so empowering for women. So, so from that perspective, it's really good. So yeah, so back to your question, you know, as any elite athlete, you, know, you, you, you become very focused about what it is that you want to achieve. You, you actually understand where you're at and where you want to go. So when people talk about my skill set, it's very much about um, planning, stakeholder relationship, and inspiring others to actually get on board on the journey. I think that's a pretty reasonable answer. <laughs> It's, it's, it sounds like an exciting endeavor. Um, but listening to you talk, and you've been a part of different sporting platforms, one thing, in my opinion, that is fading out of existence is, is the essence of a multi-sport athlete. And, and let me clarify, because I, I, I argue this a lot in my pod, is that an, so an athlete is somebody who plays more than one sport. If you just play one sport, you're, you're a basketball player, you're a rugby player, you're a hockey player. I don't, in my mind, I don't consider you an athlete unless you play two or more sports. What are your thoughts on, on students, high school athletes, even university athletes playing different sports and, and the benefits of that? Is it, am I out of sync when I say things like that? Am I thinking old school or is that something that <laughs> should still be happening? Well, I mean, I think it's not even just so much playing um, one or two sports. It's about doing one or two things in your life. I mean, uh, you know, they have a concept here within the New Zealand sports structure of which is about balance is better. You know, so it's kind of a program about making sure that you have a balanced approach to your life and so that you don't get too fixated. There are times in your life, just like your career, where you do, you know, depending on what it is that you're trying to achieve, it is very difficult to be um, only so, solely focused on, on one sport. But I have a 25 year old daughter. I mean, she played, you know, we had a family quiz the other day, which I thought I knew that she, how many sports did she play when she was young and she corrected me. It was something another, like another five or six of those in them. And I think, I think it is really important, particularly at a young age, for people to, to test different things. Sometimes you get, you get put into one activity too early on in your, in your life stream and you might be actually, you might have um, uh, a better ability to succeed in something that's different. So having that multi-sport um, approach, I think is, is really good at a, at a foundation level. But I also really believe, you know, I mean, I was a, I was a keynote speaker at a conference in Loughborough um, after New Zealand's um, high performance systems kind of really took legs. And I was, I was talking at this international conference on um, exceptional elite sport programs. And the other keynote speaker was uh, the artistic coaching director from Cirque du Soleil in Canada. And, you know, 
he he came and he, he invited several of us to come back and actually have a bit of a feel for the arts world, the peak performance and arts world. And it really resonated with me. And it's something that we've built into a lot of our programs when I was working in, in um, sport in New Zealand. And it's something that I'm, I'm always cognizant of when I'm talking to people now about the overlap between the arts world and the sports world and how much we can learn from each other um, in terms of both, you know, you've got to think about peak performance in the circus and you think, wow, you know, we, 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 have, we have athletes in, in, you know, that, that, that um, peak only once or twice in a year and they struggle with it. But if you think about what goes on in the art, arts world and, and the arts world can learn from us. And I know, I'm, I'm pretty sure in Canada they do the same, but in New Zealand, in their high performance system, you know, there's a lot of overlap now with drama schools and, and clown schools and just learning about communications in, in a different space. So I think, I think it's really important to be not one dimensional. Um, yes, that can be in a sports perspective to create that balance so that you actually really understand where your potential is. If, if you want to be an elite athlete or if you want to be a lifelong participant, you want to, you want to play a bunch of stuff but also to actually understand that art and sport have far more in common than you think. Yeah, that's really good. I, I like you're making really valid points about balance. I mean, you, you think of it from the perspective of a, of a career, you're not doing one thing every day. Like you probably have multiple tasks that you have to focus on. So you need to learn how to create those balances. Yeah. One of the things uh, I found really interesting, I'd really like you to, uh, to go into depth on this is the, the try to stop us campaign. Like some of the best games I've watched have been on the women's side, whether it's international or even high school where I am. Uh, talk to us, I guess, about the meaning behind the slogan. How is this campaign fair? It sounds like a really cool initiative. Okay. It was, a, um, so I, maybe I'll just take one step back. So when I was, I've been in the role as the general manager of women's rugby now for um, almost four years, like four years. Um, yes, I started in two, 2017, I moved up to Dublin. And my first year was very much listening and learning, listening and learning, you know, just, you know, like uh, having a, a look at what some of the challenges, what some of the amazing opportunities were to actually grow this amazing game globally. You know, I, I remember being blown away. You know, when I first started, I thought the game was about sevens and fifteens. And, and then my first general assembly I went to was in Mongolia in Ulaanbaatar. And there they had women playing snow rugby. And then you start seeing the beach rugby. And then you start even seeing the underwater rugby. I don't know if you've seen there's some great video clips that World Rugby has, has put forward on some of the underwater rugby. And I don't even understand the rules of that game. But it just made you realize there was so much potential. So listen and learn. And then what we did is we put together, you know, because I had three main focuses. One was to um, develop a, an inspirational strategy that everyone could buy into. Like, what were we trying to achieve? What was the big opportunity in terms of women's rugby? The second was to connect great practice inside the sport and outside the sport. So bringing in the way that other codes think, the other industries think, but definitely fast tracking our knowledge internally. And the third part was about making sure the accountability was in the right place around the world and around within world rugby to drive that change. Out, out of that came a five, an eight year strategy that had five colors. So probably makes pr pretty common sense when you look at any other international federation. Well, I like to think ours was a bit sharper and smarter. So it was about growing the game. So doubling the number of, of participants globally, about putting in place inspirational, aspirational competitions that were gonna attract the next generation of fans, players and, and um, investors. It was about leadership. We might be able to take some time talking about that later because that was the biggest one that we needed to crack. It was about diversified investment. So how do we actually get a proper commercial program underpinning the women's game globally and, and regionally? But also incredibly important was, was creating an impact in terms of the profile of the game. And that's where the Try and Stop Us came, came, came in. And what we did was, you know, so we kind of, when we arrived, we did the current status and we sort of said, well, what are the things that we need to really do to um, work at pace to grab the opportunity they presented it to, our, to ourselves. Um, we needed to change the look and feel of women's rugby. We needed to get people talking about women's rugby. And we needed to um, make sure that all our content was, was reflective of a game that was played by boys and girls, men and women. So not just, hey, can you see a story about a woman? So core to that was this Try and Stop Us campaign. And, and really, it was... Um, it was deliberately disruptive. I mean, I've had several people say to me, try and stop us. I mean, clearly there's a bit of a pun there about the try, <laughs> but they'd say, I've had several people, um, and I must admit, they have primarily been men, um, 
and not all men at all, but they sort of said, what's stopping you? Like, you know, really try and stop. I mean, today in today's age, is there, what's stopping women from playing rugby? And I paused there. I could mm -hmm. go on forever. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, this is the game that is, that we're trying to drive all around the world. And in, in a lot of those countries, you know, women's rights are not the best and mm -hmm. they're not even, they're not, you know, regardless of whether it's rugby, it's just even getting involved in physical activity. And that's because a, rugby, you know, rugby is such point. a, it's, you know, su rugby is such a incredibly empowering and physically challenging sport. You know, when you're sticking that into a Muslim country or you're sticking into a country where women aren't allowed to do these kind of activities, there's a lot stopping them. Yeah. And so, you know, it was what we tried to do was create a look and feel of a campaign that recognized it was a sport that was played by all sorts of cultures. It just doesn't come out of the Canada's, the US's and the, the, um, the England's and the Six Nations and a bit of New Zealand, Australia. It was a, a, a sport that was played by all sorts of nations. So we picked a 10 year old girl from Uganda and we picked, you know, um, a lot of people from the, like Senegal and from Muslim countries and from Iran. And we just pictured and we brought together women, real rugby players who had, um, had been doing some absolutely inspirational things in their countries. And they talk about the challenges that they've individually, they've each got a story about something that, that was trying to stop them. And, uh, and they've just pushed through it. And you know, if you haven't seen the video of um, Shweta from India, which is our hero video for that campaign when we launched it, and she was a little girl, a little girl, she's not a little girl, she's 19, but you know, she was- That's a little yeah, good she, for you and I though, right? She's a bit younger than me, you know, as a 50 year old. <laughs> and she was basically, you know, she, was, she, she struggled at school. She was slightly bullied and, and teased. She was a bit of a tomboy. Um, she fell in love with rugby in India and she found it on a YouTube um, of her, uh, some YouTube videos that her brother was watching, self-coached herself, decided she wanted to be a professional rugby player in India. And her uncle was against it. You know, her uncle and her mum, you know, you're going to get bruises on your legs. No one's going to want to marry you, all that kind of stuff. And she just pushed through and now she's just a superstar. Now, I think something like 12 million people watched that video in the first year of, of Shweta and her story, but the, all the stories. Um, and that we're now into another phase of that campaign where we've moved from our global 15 that we chose to having assets that everyone around the world can drop in their own stories of unstoppables. And so we're seeing all sorts of people come from all walks of, of, of rugby um, telling the story and talking about um, what it is that they've done that makes them you know, a really strong, empowered woman that can get more good, more young girls and women involved. So great campaign. But yeah, it was a disruptive, disruptive tagline. Tested it with lots of kids. They loved it. So we're keeping it. I think it's beautiful. Uh, it, like the, the pat, listen to the passion in your voice talking about this and the 19 year old and what she's com accomplished. And yeah, the, the short sightedness of some of the men you've probably bumped into along your way doing this, mm. you know, the courage and conviction that you and, and the rest of your, the rest of your, I guess partners that are working with you that it's absolutely amazing just to persevere and keep going through that's there okay. you go try and stop us screw you guys right yeah. yeah particularly now in this covid crazy world yeah, which is causing all sorts of challenges you know i'm i'm heading down i'm really lucky i'm in new zealand at the moment which kind of lives in this bubble of blissfulness um just because <laughs> of the way they've approached the, the covid so i was at the all blacks test um the last two tests, sort of seeing 40 odd thousand people in the crowd. But I'm going to the, um, the Fire Palmer Cup, which is the professional, it, well, it's not professional, but the, 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 the senior league in, in women's rugby. I'm going down to see the final on, um, on Saturday down in Christchurch. And one of our unstoppables, um, Stacey Fuller, is in the Waikato team. So it'll be good to see her. I'll be wearing my Try and Stop Us t shirt. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so you spoke a little bit, of, you know one of the things we focus on, not really focus on, but on our podcast is difference between 15 and sevens, because they're the two common games here in Canada. Sounds like you're all over the place. Do you, do you have a set focus? Is it 15s? Is it sevens? Is it tens? Is it wheelchair rugby? Is, or is it, is your role encompass everything that is women's rugby? My, my role does encompass everything that's women in rugby. And I'm quite specific when I talk about women in rugby as opposed to women's rugby, because it's not just on field playing. It's okay. about making sure that we are a sport that in all aspects, on the pitch, off the pitch, it is about women 
women in rugby, whether or not they're running men's, you know, maybe we'll talk a little bit about what we're trying to do in terms of diversity and coaching. You know, it's about um, women being involved at a, in, in um, senior leadership positions. But when it comes to sevens and fifteens, you know, I, I, I think that, um, yeah, world rugby clearly, I mean, that's one of its unique propositions is it does have so many formats of the game. So you can, you can pivot depending on where you're at and depending on what cultural aspects exist. Um, you know, the 15th, the, but when I arrived, you know, there was kind of a bit of a flow. I was invi- involved in a, a meeting before I started. I was brought over to Argentina to Buenos Aires to meet with some of the, um, the men in rugby. And uh, I, I, I heard about some of their dreams and the sevens in the Olympics had just gone off. You know, Rio was amazing. And all of a sudden we had access to different countries who all were chasing that Olympic dream. And there was kind of a bit of a dilemma at that point, you know, before I started about, well, you know, what is the focus of woman, women's rugby as, um, in terms of the game? And there were some that felt, um, you know, that sevens was the way to go. It was rapidly expanding the program. But Sir Bill Beaumont, our chairman, was very adamant. And I remember at that meeting, he sort of said to me, he said, the sevens is fantastic and it's great to be in the Olympics, but the 15s is the DNA of the game. And that we must not lose sight of the fact that the World Cup, the Rugby World Cup 2021, is the pinna- is a pin- the, one of the you know the pinnacle events of, of rugby. So I I took that on board really seriously because I realized that that with the sevens program, particularly in the in the countries that didn't have traditional rugby, um, kind of creating opportunities for them to expand their programs to create both formats of the games was one of my focuses. And we realized we had a gap and we, we had a significant gap. We'd gone from 15s to, wow, this Olympic opportunity. And we put in place a, a, a sevens series and we had the Olympics and we had a World Cup sevens. The 15s was kind of almost been put on a back burner for a period of time. Um, and over the last three years, we have um, definitely tried to address that by investing more in 15s competitions and tests. And we've been working behind the scenes now for quite some time, which hopefully we'll be in a situation to announce with, with more detail shortly, is to put in place a, a different look and feel international competition calendar for the Women's 15s program. So that we won't have teams. You know, we used to always sort of say, in, in, when I moved to, to Dublin, it became really clear you had this strong Six Nations competition. So if you were in the Six Nations, you played a lot of 15s. Mm-hmm. If you weren't in the Six Nations, you had a World Cup once every four years. And then you had kind of sporadic tests. Um, so we've been trying to plug the gaps, invest in regional competitions in 15s, and to also look at new and exciting cross, um, cross-regional competitions that we'll, you, will, you will learn more about in the next few months. So it's really exciting. So both is very important. Yeah, I, I agree. And, I, I, you know, Bill Beaumont, whether you agree with him or not, he makes a great statement, like 15s is the backbone of the sport. Sevens is a great... Uh, it's very exciting. It's nice to see it in the Olympics, okay. and it's probably great for those aspiring countries that want to get into rugby, right? But it I think is. 15s is where you want to be. It's the, the yeah. full, I agree. full version. You know, and it's interesting. You know, I, I get to work with some amazing, amazing women around the world. I've sort of said that a few times, but it just blows me away <laughs> when you get to meet these people. You know, there's a, there was a coach in Uganda who I had involved in um, in some of the way we developed our coaching staff. And so she was talking about that. So you've got, you've got countries in Africa and, and, and in Asia where the sevens came in, but, it, but one of our beauties is we are a, a, a sport for all shapes and sizes, and yeah. the sevens doesn't necessarily cater for that. So if you want to really kind of push that growth aspect, embracing both formats of the game is really important. 100%. I've had kids with high, high-functioning high autism play at my high school. And right. Yeah, I mean, so if that can happen, it's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's one of the most inclusive sports you can have, right? Especially one that has contact. So. Yes. So... You, were, you spoke about a little bit about it. I'm excited. The 2021 Rugby World Cup's less than a year away. Uh, the draw for the last three nations, I think, is coming up in early November. It's going to be live stream. What's your role there? Talk to us about how that's shaping up. That's It's going to be an amazing yeah. event. Yeah. Well, my role, I mean, look, I'm the general manager of women's rugby for the world. So I, I get this great opportunity to go and, and, and be involved in a whole range of things. I'm not the tournament director. We have a tournament director in um, World Rugby called Alison Hughes, who has a huge history. She, she was a tournament director of the World Cup in, in Ireland as well. And then New Zealand has a tournament director, uh, Michelle Hooper. And so between the two of them, they, you know, they're the ones who have the expertise in event management. 
my role in social in in relation to the World Cup is is a little bit different. I, you know, the World Cup is a, a significant opportunity to leverage a legacy and an impact beyond. So, you know, if, if any country that hosts the World Cup um, has that that sort of sitting on their shoulders, it's not just about the event. The event is amazing, and it's amazing for the for the twelve countries that will be participating and for the people that that achieve their dreams. But it's how do you use something like a World Cup to inspire the next generation of players? And you know, you know, over the next next two weeks, it's interesting. You know, actually starting tonight, I'm having meetings with each of the. We've got six regional associations, so I'm meeting with their their general managers, their lead in women's rugby, their marketing and communications people, and bringing our team together to say, 2021 is going to be an absolutely game-changing year for women's rugby. I think we're the only international federation that has got an Olympic Games and a World Cup in the same year. And that's <laughs> not deliberate. It's kind of unique. <laughs> and a lot of people saw that as, oh my gosh, is this possible? And should we move the World Cup? No, we deliberately said no. We, get, we understand there's an overlap between sevens and fifteens players, but you know, 2022 is going to be so cluttered with events that have been moved from 2021 because mm -hmm. of the Olympics. So we want to harness that. So I, so my role is to work with those regions and the unions on how do you supercharge women's rugby by leveraging off on this opportunity and making sure as many young boys and girls and women can be inspired what they're going to see on the field and putting in place programs, whether it's leadership or coaching or um, um, marketing, like, you know, upping the ante with our trans office campaign to get them to leverage what's going to happen. So it's kind of really a, I mean, it's, I, I talk about myself as a, a, um, a, 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 a supercharged stakeholder relationship manager for the women's game, and it's to connect the dots. Um, uh, you know, clearly I'm here right now, which is amazing because part of that role here is to help drive some of the excitement and get people excited about the World Cup. So last week I was up speaking in you know, the, the rugby World Cups in Auckland and in Northland. So I was up speaking to the, the council up in Whangarei that would be hosting event. Had 300 council members just kind of getting them really excited about what an amazing opportunity they're going to have next year with these teams from around the world. Um, then I was talking to the sporting community. Um, you know, we are really fortunate here that we have got a prime minister in New Zealand who is absolutely passionate about sport, women's she leadership. Is. <laughs> and rugby when she comes along to the the women's rugby games i've met her a couple of times you know she's been brought in to hand out jerseys for the blackburns and i know that she is really passionate about the world cup in new zealand and we will hope to have her very involved in in the event both the on field and we're looking at running an international forum looking at where we're at in terms of women in rugby so hopefully she'll be involved in that as well that's awesome. Yeah, she's very passionate. She, you see her on, you know, at matches, or it's it's pretty cool to see that happen. Yes. Um, I think it's a very exciting opportunity. You get the the Olympics, and they're they're going to end, so you, everybody's going to get all jazzed up over the sevens, and then what a month month and a half later, the rugby yeah, world cup totally. starts. So like you guys, are, the girls' side is going to have a monopoly on rugby next year. It's going to be pretty amazing Absolutely. for you. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. What's um. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really cool. So let's talk a little bit now about some of the things that you've tried to implement. You've, you, yeah. you, you speak a little bit about on the pitch, but I, I want to hear more about your business side of the game or women in coaching and, you know, maybe Roblox. And you've spoken a little bit about Roblox, but talk to us about some of those tweaks and changes that you've tried to implement in your, in your you know, short time so far at uh, rugby at World Rugby. Right. Well, you know, I think I sort of said that I have that, have that three focuses and the last of those three focuses is making sure the accountability is in the right place across the globe and across the organization to drive the transformational change. And this is transformational change that we're trying to put in place. Um, so the area that, that I take, uh, I guess, a, an internal leadership or a real close facilitation is, is on the leadership color. And because uh, I fundamentally believe, I mean, the way you change things from a sustained change is to, is to work at evolving the leadership to make sure that the leadership is reflective of the stakeholders. So when we, when I started at World Rugby in um, 2017, we were governed by a council of 30 men. So we had um, a population, global population of about 27% of women participating in the game and our highest decision-making um, board was 30 men. That was the <laughs> council. Um, so right away, that's kind of a significant challenge. But, you know, I, I remember sort of sitting down halfway through my first year as we were kind of developing the strategy of the things that we need to put in place and, 
And a, a couple of the, the, the men on the, we have a women's advisory committee, which is really unique. And I think it's, it's great practice, international great practice in that it is 50% men, 50% women. And the 50% men, one would argue are probably the most um, influential men in the game. So it was the chairman, the vice chairman, the chief executive. And then it was, um, when I started, it was the chief executive of Australian rugby, a guy called Bill Pulver. And now it's Sir Simone as the vice president of France. So pretty powerful or influential, I should say, men in the game. And they, we talked about what do we want to see in terms of off field leadership? How do we, how do we drive the change? And we, so we, collectively work through you know what do we need to do there was a, a, a phase where and actually canada is a great example here there was a phase where people wanted to put in place quotas and i mean like different people have different opinions it kind of polarized whether you have quotas or you don't have quotas for women in leadership and women in senior roles mm -hmm. we decided not to do that and deliberately i remember having this conversation sort of saying we can't put quotas on any international any of our members unless we fix ourselves i mean look we're governed by 30 men and so um, it was David Kerby who works with me, came up with a suggestion on how we could really rapidly change what we, we looked at. Um, and there was a loophole in our constitution and we just basically exploited it. And it was driven by Bill Beaumont. We had to contact all the, the um, some of the, 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 what we used to call tier one nations to actually get them on board. But we moved, we added 17 women directors um, to our board at the same time that we signed off on the women's plan. So we signed off on the women in rugby plan. And then on the very same day, we brought, we went from zero to 35% on our senior leadership, our senior decision making. And then what we did is we kind of rolled with that because because we could then ha ha talk to our unions in Canada. Canada was one of the first ones that made a significant change. They, they we, we had produced a resource called Balancing the Board, which looked at what is the business case for change? How, what are the kind of quick steps you could do to, to, to do that? Why was diversity important? And, 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 and they changed, they were the first union to change their constitution to say that there would be a minimum of 40%, maximum of 60% on their board. And that was, that's best practice. So I've used that as an example. That was being um, um, driven by Kathy, who's, you know, vice president, one of the vice presidents on the board. And, you know, you had Rue and you had a, a bunch of, and, of men and women driving a change. So that happened everywhere. So changing, so then, then linked to that, what we did was we said, well, you know, someone said to me, oh, where are these women going to come from that are going to sit on these councils and these unions? And I said, well, well, everywhere, <laughs> anywhere, anywhere. But if you don't think, they, if you don't think that they're good enough, of course they are good enough, give me some money and I'll develop them, which was a great opportunity to put in place a, an amazing, sneaky, um, sneaky. <laughs> a, a really amazing, uh, uh, pipeline program. So we have an executive leadership development program and that's, that's awesome. what um, Ruchinto's on, where we have unions and regions identify women who are either on boards or who are in senior leadership positions or who have the ability to be there within two years. It's a 10,000 pound scholarship program. Nice. So it's, it's quite significant. They're given a mentor. Um, we sit down and work with them. Where are they at? Where do they want to be? And what is that thing or two things that they would like to learn to actually get there. Sometimes it's formalized study, sometimes it's best practice tours, sometimes it's just time with, with people, you know, connecting the dots. And they have done amazing things. I mean, you know, Rue from Canada being one of them, she was, her mentor was, was Mark Harrington, um, who is the technical services lead inside World Rugby. And, and he and her worked through a, a way of creating opportunities for her to be involved in some of the World Rugby um, leadership groups. Um, she's now on the board of Rugby, Rugby America's North. And, but just seeing where these women have gone to is has been you know so, so we've now got five of the women that are on scholarships are now on the world rugby council and several of them are in senior very very senior positions and then there's coaching do you want me to tell you about coaching because that's yeah really i love that. i love okay, coaching coaching i love coaching too and i've, I've never been a coach i mean if I, I was always the one who was the team manager my sister who competed with me at the olympics she was she was the one who became the coach i was always the team manager kind of person um, but I absolutely, um, you know, coaches make great leaders and coaches develop leaders and that kind of role modeling that you see when you have um, great coaches is inspirational. So we set about having a look at what was going on in coaching and we brought in this, um, this woman called Carol Isherwood, who's uh, in the World Rugby Hall of Fame, the, um, you know, long time, pretty impressive athlete for the, the RFU. 
Um, and she worked with um, World Rugby on doing a, a, a proper current state analysis in 2017. And at that stage, we had a look at the top 16 sevens and 15 teams. So we had 32 teams. There was only one country in the world that had a woman as a head coach at that time. And there was only four of those 32 teams that had women involved in assistant coaching capacity. So a problem. Um, we, we did a huge review. We, we canvassed our unions. We had a look at organizations like, like um, Sport Canada and Coaching Canada and the equivalent around the world. And we looked at who was doing great stuff in terms of changing the look and feel of coaching. We set a target and that was about a commitment to diversity in coaching. It wasn't saying that all women's teams should be coached by work. It was saying that women are great coaches and we needed to unlock what were the, some of the blockages that were, were stopping or not enabling women getting into some of those leadership coaching positions. So we came out with a, a whole holistic range of um, 10 recommendations, which looked at um, what were the, the major barriers. And it kind of came down to the fact that a lot of people have invested a lot of money in training women because they think the women are the problem so you know they're not confident we'll just put them on a course they'll be but they're still not being appointed and so the reality is is that if you don't have a holistic solution to address women in leadership positions you're just never going to crack it and so so um you need to change um the culture of organizations you need to change the attitude i mean one of the big things that you have to address in in rugby and, and not so much rugby all women's sports is that women athletes sometimes have this unconscious bias about um, men and women coaches and believe that men coaches are better than women coaches. Yeah. And that's because the majority of them are coached by men all the time. And so you've yeah. obviously, you've got this kind of thing that you've got to break down some of those perceived challenges that exist for women to get through. And so uh, holistic solutions, we've, we've done stuff like, I think we've done about 96 profiles of women coaches over the last 18 months. <laughs> but one of the big ones that we have done is we have put in place an internship program for 2021 okay. um, so that every single team that competes at the World Cup um, has been given the opportunity to have an extra accreditation to bring uh, as part of their coaching team on the basis that it's that that position is filled by a woman and that that woman is involved in their coaching program for the full 12 months in the lead up to the World Cup. And then we've got a program that's sitting outside that helping with mentors and helping with reflective coaching. So that by we, when we finish the World Cup next year, there'll be 12 more coaches who on their CV will be able to say they have coached at a World Cup level. So trying to create deployment opportunities, trying to deal with the, the profile. Yes, we still are doing some, some professional development opportunities and we're doing it with other codes. We're doing a, we're, we were fortunate to be picked as one of the pilot programs with the IOC to do a coaching program with five other sports, you know, rowing, um, uh, weightlifting, tennis, um, and a few others to just do a cross sport, uh, 18 month program, looking at seven coaches, but yeah, we're definitely committed to changing the look and feel of by the time we hit 2025, that 40% of all the coaches that are at the world cup that year will be women. So we're looking at, at so making some changes. Is that the intention is to try and eventually just, it's just women coaching women, or is the intention, it's just, let's give it to the best person available and make sure everybody's on equal footing when they go through the process of uh, applying for these jobs. It's the second of the two. Yeah. And when you, you're just going to unpick and it's to get more women coaching men. You know, I mean, I, you know, ideally, yeah. if you ask me what my personal vision is, is that every World Cup, that every team that's competing at the World Cup, the men's World Cup, would have women as part of their coaching team as well. So, you know, I mean, that's, that's really, I mean, you know, if you believe in diversity, and you Why believe not? in diversity of thought, it's not just in the boardroom and it's not just in, in organizations, it's actually out on the coaching field. Oh. And, you know, building both, um, you know, thinking about that as a, a strategic um, uh, move in terms of improving coaching, I think is really important. I, I imagine there's many, many female coaches that could coach circles around the men that are already employed, right? So. It's just a matter of. I wouldn't say that. I'd be very careful. I'll say it. I'll say it. You can say that, but I, but I, but I'm really at, at you know I make it really clear when I'm talking to the men coaches is that this isn't about saying men aren't great coaches, and it's certainly not saying that we want all women's teams to, to be coached by men by a woman. It's not that because there's some absolutely amazing you know great men coaches, but we really have to address the fact that. You know, why, when you have such a huge participation um, in women, are women not rising in terms of the coaching? What are yeah. the barriers? What do we need to do to actually 
create those opportunities to ensure that great women coaches can coach great teams. Do you think it's something, and maybe I'm just naive here, but may, do you think it's something where women's rugby has just kind of taken off, over, the, really taken off over the last 10 years, in my mind, and that those players, a lot of times coaches are ex-players and maybe they're just not that, at that uh, time frame in their life yet where they're becoming coaches? Or is that part of it or is it? It could be part of it, but what we need to do to make sure is that as those those um, those young women transition, because we do want people to have lifelong um, participation in rugby, so we want them to participate when they finish playing and coaching and leadership positions, um, you know, for life, or keep playing, or keep playing. But we need to make sure, you know, one of the 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 um, I think probably one of the risks if we didn't do what we did is is that the women's game will will grow. Into being, into being a professional sport over time. It's not at that stage yet. I mean, it is in some countries um, and it will take some time. I mean, we're working on a commercial program and every country's at a different stage. But what we wanna do is to make sure that as more and more money gets invested into women's rugby and we get more and more um, um, paid coach positions, you know, we don't want to have a situation where um, the women's game is used as a career stepping for men who want to have a career in men's rugby. If that, right. if, if, Coaching women's rugby is is their um, their long term their goals, and that's great, and they get there. But we want to make sure that as the game becomes more and more um, more money comes into it, and more paid positions exist, that we get more women involved in the game as well. Absolutely. Speaking of where where do you see the women's game in ten years? Well, um, ultimately, the big level of the big big picture thing that we're trying to do besides accelerate the global development of women in rugby is to normalize women's involvement in rugby. We need to get to the stage where it is, when you think about it, you think about it in the same mind as you might think about cycling or swimming. You know, it's a sport that's played by women and men, girls and boys. It's not a sport that's played by men and some, and, and in some countries, in some countries, they're well on the way to doing that. And you know, if you look at some of the countries in Asia, for example, Laos, and we'll use them as an example, People in Laos think that rugby is a girl sport, not a boy sport, because there's more women than, than, you know, you look at that in India, there's, I think, 46% of all their members are women. So when you think about some of those countries, or Iran, you know, 10,000 women playing rugby in Iran. That's amazing. You know, it's, so in some of those countries, you're seeing rapid rises, but in others, it's still a, you know, we play rugby too kind of attitude. So we need to get the game, the look and feel, the, the, the accessibility of what you, you can watch, you know, or stream um the the kind of the leadership we need more chief executives that are women we need to make sure that this is a game that on and off the field is it's looking like it's 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 men and women it's not you know just some so that's the big challenge and it, and it isn't just one of those things so it, it is which is why this the strategy which is currently an eight-year strategy so you know hopefully if we achieve all that we'll be well on our way to to the vision for 10 years but it is about all those things coming together. It's not just about development, it's about profile, it's about leadership, it's about diversified investment. So, you know, having a strong commercial program underpinning the game is, is really important in terms of feeding the number of competitions that you have, in terms of, you know, great on-field products driving your, um, your profile and your investment. So all of those things moving into a stage where, um, you know, we just go up the next level. So do you, do you think by that, uh, I'm trying to do the math in my head, which I'm not, I'm a teacher, but I don't teach math. So yeah. sometimes my numbers fail me. So by 2030, 2031, that Rugby World Cup, do you think there'll be 20 teams like there is at the Men's World Cup? Is that like one of the objectives is trying to get, bring more yeah, teams? Yeah. We, we haven't talked about 20 teams, but we certainly um, are, have been doing some modeling about the next World Cup. I mean, we've gone out to, to um market for the next two World Cups in men's and women's and together in a combined document in terms of the bidding process. And we have certainly um, talked about moving from 12 to 16 teams by 2025. Um, now, if we need to revisit that from, for the next World Cup after that, then so be it. What we need to, we need to really focus on, I mean, that's one of the, the big things. And it's the same, with the, it is the same for the men, but they've had so much more investment for so long, is that what we want to do is we want to create a game that anyone who competes at the World Cup could win. We don't want to have a, a situation where you've got the top, you know, three to six teams and then a huge gap between the next. So we've got a lot of work. So the, our aim in the, in the high performance um, competition stream has been to close the gap in margins between the top half and the bottom half of the field. 
So to do that, we need to invest heavily in some of the up and coming countries to make sure that they, they can be competitive. And our new look at where we might go in terms of global competitions will help with that as well. But there's a big gap in terms of on-field performance in some of those teams. So, so um, to go to 20 might be a bit of a stretch too far. We want to make sure we've got a really competitive 16 by the time we hit 2025. Yeah, that's fair. One of, one of the things I, I've thought of is, you know, the, the 20 that go to the men's game, there's always four or five that are kind of, you know, they're on the periphery that they could get in and, you know, et cetera. So I was wondering, I know it's trying, world rugby is trying to move away from tier one, tier two, but what if there were like two versions of the world cup? Maybe you've got your top 12 and then you've got, you know, another eight that compete the year before and maybe those four winners get in and maybe the bottom four from the world cup actually get relegated for the following one or some way that there's like a promotion ladder. Like, I don't know. It's just, Sometimes I have these random thoughts rolling around my head when I'm supposed to be teaching my class. And I think of these little things <laughs> instead. <laughs> don't tell my boss. I don't think he listens to these, but you know, that, that happens. Right. So yeah. that's, that's one of those things like a relegation yeah. pool almost. Or something. Yeah. Well, we definitely, the new, the new kind of concept that we're looking at for the woman's game would be a competition that would happen on a far more regular basis and it would have relegation promotion. But I mean, any ideas you have or anyone has in terms of great, global and regional competitions would be welcome from world rugby. I mean, we are, we do work really closely. Um, you know, it, we're a relatively small international federation. So um, it's not necessarily the brain's chest of the world. So we definitely bring in people from all around to um, help us think through cooperative solutions to some of the challenges that exist for the globe. Um, we've just appointed, I think that was publicized. So I'm not leaking anything out. We've just appointed a, a new um, competition director is an ex-colleague of mine who used to work with me for many, many years. But he's um, from New Zealand, a guy called Nigel Cass. And he starts, he starts the beginning of November. And nice. he will be working with um, Alan Gilpin, who heads our Rugby World Cup stuff, to give um, what we do in terms of competitions a real good deep dive. And so, you know, it's it, it, any international federation that sits on its laurels and doesn't rethink and um, reimagine what's possible in terms of competition, it would just, it's, it's really going backwards. So all ideas are welcome, Jamie. So please do send them in. <laughs> we'll do this. Uh, just so you know, this is being recorded. It's going to, it'll probably po uh, post in about two weeks. So if that was information that wasn't supposed to come out, you're, you'll say you're safe. You so it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Katie, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Wow, I'll be very old. I'm 56. But you know, I you know, I really firmly believe that you get stale if you don't reinvent yourself as well. Um, you know, I have worked in the support sector for a long time, but I was very, very lucky that I was constantly given really stimulating new challenges. And then I stepped out and did some really amazing things in the arts world. You know, I sort of set up New Zealand's equivalent of high performance sport for the arts world in Wellington. Um, I don't know. I mean, will I be retired? I'll be I'll be 66. Um, reflecting on maybe some of the differences I've made um, and hopefully have people spotted all around the place that I've been able to work with in terms of their leadership, seeing them do great things. But I really believe that when people say to me, what, what's the legacy you live? I, you know, I really believe in, in people and people are what make the world a great place and people who are, you know, open and authentic and committed to doing great things for others is something that I like to work with. So I do spend a lot of time mentoring all sorts of people and I hope that they'll be doing amazing things myself. Um, where will I be in 10 years? Yes. Yeah, so I will be maybe on some boards. Um, I can't see myself really retiring, although I will be of that <laughs> age. Um, and um, I, like I said, hopefully, hopefully I'll be a grandmother. I have a 25 year old daughter. I'm really looking forward to being a grandmother and taking no her pressure to, there. No pressure. No pressure, for your daughter. No pressure Addie, in New Zealand, <laughs> but taking her to sport and sort of seeing, you know, helping her kind of um, uh, fulfill her dreams and desires. That's awesome. So one of the things that I, that I try and incorporate in my coaching with my high school team, and I coach a rookie rugby program as well. And is the thought of being a good ancestor. You're, you're talking about that. I don't know yeah. if you're, you're intentionally talking about that, but in my mind, you're le when, when you leave, you know, in 10 years or five years, whatever, on your own terms, you're leaving that role at World Rugby in better position than it was five years ago, in my mind. And I think that's all that, you know, you can ask of yourself. Yeah. So, so good on you. Thank Last you. thing, as you said, you never played rugby. Um, uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, but 
yet yet yes there you hey there you go i start <laughs> i start i haven't played in 17 years and i started playing again this year at 44 so there's always hope i i'd love to hear some type of fun athletic story from you it's not going to be from rugby maybe it's something from the pool um anything that you can think of that uh, just fun that you know shows a different side of you that uh, is for good humor yeah fun oh gosh there's a without getting you in trouble with your bosses there's a few stories i probably shouldn't tell you know <laughs> i was a bit of a wild one when i was young in terms of not necessarily obeying all the rules so won't um we won't go there because now i you know clearly i don't play in that space but i I, um, you know, we, I mean, as a water polo player, we used, to, we, used to, we used to, when I was playing for UBC, and I had a lot of, um, of um, women who were part of my, my water polo team that I did sync my swimming with as well. You know, we used to, I mean, water polo, I mean, a bit like rugby, it's a kind of a party hard kind of game, isn't it? Very physically demanding, but we used to regularly turn up to the pool and never have been to bed, you know, just go straight, straight from the after match into the practice. Um, so there's all sorts of funny stories like that. But, you know, I think probably more, you know, and it's not so much a funny story about my life, but I think about when did I really know that I was, um, was really inspired by what it was that I, that I do was, was probably when I was working in administration. Um, and I, you know, I've been to a lot of Olympics and Commonwealth Games, uh, so I'm knowing, so I'm very, very fortunate in, in with that regard. Obviously, the, the most important ones are the ones that you competed in, but I used to look after the government's investment and, and we had just kind of turned around a, you know, put in place a, a really amazing program. And I was at, um, in Athens at the Olympics and I was there with the minister and it happened to be, I turned 50 on the opening ceremonies of the Olympic games in Athens. So I came home when I got back to New Zealand, I had this amazing toga party for everyone who couldn't join me, but I have claimed the opening ceremonies of the Olympics in Athens as a birthday party that Jacques Roque put on for me. But of course that wasn't the case. <laughs> um, but that games was really a, a really special one for us in terms of what we were trying to achieve in high performance. And we had some really good results from the New Zealand team, but I just remember being at the, the men's triathlon. So we're talking about multi-sports uh, stuff. I was at the men's triathlon. I was down with all the people that were working so hard to change the system. And New Zealand um, athletes won um, gold and silver in the men's event one after the other to see those two come home and you just got you know you know how you just get that kind of spine and i get it with all sport you know whether it's i'm really looking forward to watching the fire palmer cup next week down in, in new zealand and seeing these amazing women or or it's that track cyclist on the field or it's that you know it's that eight-year-old swimmer who just makes it across that 25 meters in backstroke for the first time ever and the smile on their faces i mean, I really really believe in the power of sport and it really um you know whether it's whether it's elite sport people or just people having fun next weekend i'll just just do a plug for and it may be that when this is i'm i've enrolled myself in a across the bridge across the Auckland um, bridge um i'm not going to run it my knees are a bit wrecked from my water polo days and synchronized swimming days but i'm going to do the cross the bridge and i'll be doing it with thousands and thousands and thousands of others and you know you gotta sort of say anyone who works in this sector just gets a real buzz from seeing people being active <laughs> that's pretty cool you're gonna to have to follow up with me and let me know how you did so that when this airs i can actually talk about it. that'll be really cool yeah. that's awesome <laughs> listen katie i really appreciate you taking the time i know you have a very busy schedule we've been trying to to sign a time here for the last month and a half i think so uh and i think it took a holiday in new zealand for it to happen so <laughs> thank you very much i really appreciate it i love your passion your energy for rugby and sports and athletics and uh, I, I, you know, I wish you nothing but the best as you move forward there at Women's World Rugby and especially with the World Cup coming up in less than a year. So thank you very Great. much. Thank you, Jamie. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much, Katie. That was, uh, that was a lot of fun. You've got a lot of energy, a lot of great thoughts on the game of rugby for women's but it definitely could transcend both genders sorry both both uh, levels of rugby men female what have you uh thanks for taking the time to chat with us best of luck as you prep for the rugby world cup in 2020 and the olympics which are in 2020 as, as well as each are less than a year away it's going to be a great year for women's rugby olympics rugby world cup the women are going to steal the show next year and it's going to be awesome and great to see and no offense to the other nations, but Canada for gold at the Olympics, Canada for gold at the World Cup. That's what we're pushing for. Thanks, Katie, for bringing, uh, for bringing this all, all to our attention. It's awesome. Coming up soon, though, next pod will feature Harry Jones, Canada's sevens fame. He's going to be chatting with us. And we also have a, a nice intro with up-and-comer Gabriel Casey, who's going to do the kind of promo that spot for you as well. 
And we also have Jonathan Kaplan. Jonathan, when he retired, was the most decorated official for rugby, world rugby ever. Uh, he's since been passed by Nigel Owens. Um, Jonathan and I sat down and had a really great conversation around rugby. Uh, as always, just want to say thank you to the listeners. Keep spreading the good rugby word. It's uh, it's humbling when, when you see the Canadian rock climb the charts for podcast rugby podcasts in Canada and, and Japan. We've reached number one in Japan, which is uncanny. It's amazing. I'm not really sure why, but I, I think that's really awesome. But it's important that we keep spreading the good rugby word, whether it's to Canadians, whether it's internationally, so that people understand where our athletes, where our business people are coming from, how they got there, so that we can see that there's ways for us to get there as well. As always, I want to say thanks to Ben Sound Music for supplying us with their tunes. And as I said at the top of the pod, feel free to request topics for future podcasts, request guests, uh, request questions. Make sure you, you send that in because I don't know what you want me to ask if you don't tell me. So thank you for listening. As always, this is Jamie. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane. But most importantly, you know it. Keep on rocking. Mm-hmm.